Okay, if y'all can please take your seats. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. We want to be sure to start on time. Um, I know we have a lot of people in the Zoom room as well. So thank you all for being here in person then. I'm Lisa Epstein. I'm the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. The JCRC is the community outreach and public affairs arm of the Jewish Federation. And one of our pillars is Yom Ta'alun al Dam Re'echam. Do not stand idly by. Following this principle, our JCRC demonstrates a commitment to amplifying the Jewish community's voice on critical issues in the public sphere. And that includes participation in our democracy. So thank you all for being a part of this. And thank you to our, our candidates and to our uh, moderator. Um, and special thanks to the JCRC and NCJW volunteers who helped um, create this event and who are here today helping out as well. Now I'd like to introduce Mia Lopez, the chair of our JCRC. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you everyone for being here with us this afternoon. And I'd like to welcome our candidates, Trish Berry and Peter Sakai. And I'd like to say a few words about um, Jim Lefko before we get going. Jim joined News 4 Fox 29 as a reporter after 20 years in the newspaper business as sports editor for the Indy Star and San Antonio Express News. Most of Jim's professional career was spent in newspapers as a sports writer, columnist, and sports editor. He has been a general assignment reporter for News 4 and Fox 29 for the past four years, covering everything from politics to education, crime, and the military. Jim has been a member of Temple Bethel for over 17 years. And thank you, Jim, for agreeing to be our moderator this afternoon. We have a prepared list of questions that audience members submitted in advance. We do not have time to answer every question that was submitted, but we will cover as many as time permits. After a three minute introduction, the candidates will each get two and a half minutes to respond to each question. We will alternate who goes first. After a coin flip, it was determined that Trisha Berry uh, will begin with her introduction. Mr. Berry, please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for Bear County General. Test, test, test. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Uh, my kids have never told me they couldn't hear me before. So I'm the mother of a 17 and a 20 year old. So obviously you roll the roost and you make sure that you hold them accountable. So anyway, let me just say I am blessed, I'm privileged, I'm humbled, I'm honored to be with you all today. And so glad that we have the opportunity to talk about our platform. So as you all may or may not know, native San Antonio, born and raised here. Um, my dad was a career Air Force veteran. My mom worked in civil service at Fort Sam Houston. And then I worked at Kelly Air Force Base for a number of years. She retired as a GS-13, uh, which is unheard of really at the time that she was working. And so anyway, single mom for most of her life. I'm the youngest of six kids. Uh, it's where I found my voice was in the home as the youngest of six children because I learned how to speak up for seconds at the dinner table, and I learned how to speak up for the right to use the one restroom that we all share. So, listen folks, I was raised with a hard work ethic, um, and really what I call uh, by a single mother for the most part, uh, regarding grit and grace. Um, and, and that is what I bring to the table. And so as we look at where I've grown up and where I've been, I never left this community. Um, I went to UTSA for two years, when I'm graduating from Trinity University because I got a partial scholarship opportunity there, worked in television news for 10 years, and then founded two businesses over the course of the past 25 years. And I think that that's important. Pragmatic business experience is important in what you take into the office. So one of the stops that I made along the way was not too far from here at Summerview, um, here on Northwest Military. So I lived there for probably about Almost eight or nine years, I accessed what is now known as Harburger Park, uh, but it was not Harburger Park, but you could still access and move into the trails and weed yourself in there. And so, you know, my kids actually went to summer programs at the JCC. So thank you for what you all do for the youth associated with JCC, because my kids certainly thrived in this environment. There's no question. 
Um, and I like to think that maybe a little bit of that transpired or maybe inspired my son, who is a junior at UT uh, right now, but he's in a fraternity there and he is part of a Jewish fraternity um, at UT. He's a Sam uh, and does great things there within Sammy. We were not raised Jewish, but he found his tribe, he found his collective calling, and he loves it. He has absolutely thrived in that community, and I could not be prouder of what he's accomplished there. So when I talk about what I want to bring to this office, pragmatic business experience on the front of a paycheck and the back of a paycheck, made tough decisions on commissioner's court as a result of that pragmatic business experience, lowered the property tax rate to the lowest it's been in 25 years. Had a you know, paternity leave and maternity leave policy at the county. So we'll talk more about those things, but I think you can tell my DNA is in this community. And I am more than happy to serve as your next Bureau County Judge and be here before you today. Thank you. What's the guy? Please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you were running for Judge. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, the Jewish Community Relations Council, <laughs> JR. JRCRC. I want to thank y'all for putting this opportunity. My name is Judge Peter Sakai, and I'm running for county judge. And I'm asking for your support and asking your vote. I think what's important today is to recognize how important you are as the voice, the power of your community, and how you need to be at the table for any decision, especially the county man, in regards to what it may impact you and your community. We have a lot of issues, we have a lot of problems, but we got to come up with solutions. As you know, I have been a public servant for the last 40 years. A lot of people don't recognize that I did work in the district attorney's office as the chief prosecutor for the juvenile section and the child abuse section back then. That was my connection to children and families. And then I left the private practice, started a, a, a lucrative private practice for 11 years and basically ran a small business. Then Judge, the late Andy Morales, and Judge Josh Speech said, hey, Judge Scott, you need to be the new children's court judge in 1995. It was this new court, what we call children's court. And at that time, Judge Nelson Wolf and Tracy Wolf started what was called the children's court. And so we committed to focus in on those abuse and neglect cases. And we created a nationally renowned program that is copied not only in the state of Texas, but throughout the country for what we do for children and families. When Judge Fischer decided to retire, I decided to step up and run for the 225th Mark for four terms, three unopposed. That's the reason why I also want to thank you because y'all have been part of that community that has supported me for all those entire period of time. So when Judge Wolf decided to sit down and retire, I decided to step up to be your next county judge in order to focus in and continue my public service. Not only am I a public servant, but I'm a servant leader, which means I want to serve your, our community and really focus in on what's most important, the children and families of our community. During those period of time that I was 26 years on the children's court, I handled some of the tough decisions dealing with life and death decisions in regards to children and families. It was my ability to listen give dignity and respect to everybody who came to the court and make decisions to fix those problems that those families have. Some people say, well, what's going to make you a great county judge? Well, if you can't fix family, then you can't fix anything. And that's what's important. And so in our children's court, we created a family drug court, parents with addiction. We created an early childhood court, a baby court, putting mothers and babies together again. We created a college-bound docket that I'm most proud of to focus in and work on our issues of children and families. I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you all very much. I'm going to interview the question portion of our program. I will be all in. Who goes first? Judge Sakai, you'll uh, start off with the first question. It deals with the topic of anti-Semitism. The Jewish community has faced an increase in anti-Semitism nationwide. And in Bear County, a physical threat to synagogues this past summer as well as a barrage of anti Semitic flyer distributions, banners, and protests in our country. What would you, as county judge, do to promote the safety of the Jewish community 
in the face of anti Semitic threats and incidents that have recently occurred? And what would you do to decrease the spread of anti Semitism? First, I would unequivocally condemn, openly condemn, the acts of hate, not only as anti Semitic, but to any ethnic group. Unfortunately, those issues also apply to the Asian community. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to step up, because I want to be able to show my children, my grandchildren, that this community, Bear County, has such compassion and heart. Yes, we have acts of anti-Semitism. We have acts of anti-Asian. Unfortunately, we have leadership that tends to promote that type of culture. But as a proven leader, especially as a judge for 26 years, I have promised to give dignity and respect to everybody who came into that court. And that is my promise to you as your next county judge. What we're also going to have to do is promote and encourage the reporting of hate crimes. You know, my parents would have said, you know what, Peter, when you were a little kid and teased and taunted as a little kid for being an Asian, you know, just ignore those people. Unfortunately, we're living in a time where we cannot. We're going to have to report those hate crimes so that we can document and then determine what resources we have to put in to counter and effectively combat those acts of hate. Finally, we got to promote the resources here at the Jewish Community Center with the Holocaust Museum. I've had opportunities to come visit. My wife, Rachel, was a teacher at Providence who brought her students here to teach people about the history of the Holocaust. And that's my commitment to you, to support the museum, the preservation of history, because it's the same issue that I had with my father who was interned in World War II as a Japanese American. So I share those issues, and I promise to always condemn acts of hate and acts of hate speech. Thank you. There. Mm -hmm. Folks, this is not just about talking the talk. This is about walking the walk. And when we say we will condemn what happens, it's not just about putting something out on social media and saying we can tell. It's about standing out in front of people and calling a press conference and telling people this will not be tolerated anymore. The attacks that you all have faced from an unknown source, which by the way, um, I'm under attack by an unknown source right now, which my opponent says he knows nothing about, which I find hard to believe, but we can't continue to have anonymous sources attack not just politicians, but attack your community on a very regular basis. You need to call them out for that act of hatred. And by the way, when the last incident happened as a county commissioner, I made sure that I called the Jewish Federation. I talked to Nami and I said, hey, I don't want to put anything out there that's going to be, you know, in opposition or fuel the fire associated with this hatred. Because as a crisis communications person, what do you do? You don't want to overreact because you don't want to make them credible for what they're doing. So I worked with Nami very specifically on what the response was going to be. And I said, by the way, come into my office. We'll talk for an hour. And we'll talk about what the county can do to be able to help out this community in a way that's substantive, much like what I was able to do regarding, I, look, folks, I'm not one that sits on the sidelines. You know, I get engaged because I just feel like I have a bad DNA in my personality regarding if there are bad things happening to people that are not just and not right and not fair, I become engaged. One of those specific examples was during cyberbullying and legislation regarding basically hate crimes against children. When David Molak in Alamo Heights hung himself because of a severe case of cyberbullying, I didn't know the Molaks were anybody. But I had a mutual friend and we sat down at the table and I talked to Maureen Molak and I said, what do you want to do? And she said, I do not want David's death to be in vain. We're going to pass legislation to make sure that there are repercussions associated with cyberbullying. And so what I'll commit to you today, we passed that legislation. There are far greater repercussions associated with that. And so the hate crimes that exist today against you all or any other ethnicity here in this county 
will not be tolerated and we will take action. Thank you. Some in our community, especially seniors, had difficulties voting by mail during the primaries. They got confused and did not follow the new law to sign the lab and put the wrong number on their application to vote by mail. They did not receive their vote by mail ballot in time. Question How would you characterize the accuracy and integrity of elections in Bear County at all levels, local, state, national? And what, if any, changes would you make? Um, over the, the years, you all may or may not know, I've worked on a lot of behind the scenes campaigns. And I will tell you, based upon the experience that I have had with Jackie Callan in Memory County, she is a woman of integrity and she works really hard. And so she has been under unprecedented pressure and unfair pressure, considering the job that she has done in that office to the, to the point where you had an active shooter situation there where the elections office is. That's not sustainable, it's not tolerable, it will not be accepted. Granted, look, technology is outpacing what we're doing with elections for sure. But we've gotta make sure that we have faith in those that are running the system and I have faith in Jackie Callan and what she's doing. But we also have to make sure that we shore things up so that we make sure our seniors are protected. There is no question. Look, my dad, who's 95, who I went by and saw on Friday night when he fell in his kitchen, I was in the hospital, he came back home. You know, is somebody who's one of those consistent voters. He votes, you know, kind of hell or high water, rain or shine. He's going to be there. But we've got to make sure that they're protected because there are people out there who are trying to take advantage of them. Not just in whether it's ballot harvesting, but it's scamming them every day on the internet, from a telephone, which is why. I restored the elder fraud unit to the DA's office when I got into the office as county commissioner because guess what? It's a growing population and the elderly cannot wait on restitution or prosecution associated with elder fraud. One of my proudest moments on that court was when I was able to restore that with the DA's office after five years of it being vacant. But going back to the original question regarding what do we have to do to make sure that we have election integrity Sure, there are things that we can shore up and we look at making convenient ways for people to be able to vote because that is what voting is about, right? Making it convenient for people. But whether you're doing a drive-by voting or whether you're voting uh, you know, regarding ballot by mail or what have you, we have to make sure that there are security measures that are in place. And by the way, it may mean at some point, Jackie Callahan, who's been there for a number of years, who I have great respect for, will probably be looking at a new elections administrator in a couple of years. And so we're gonna to have to pay close attention to that. But I think the elections office is doing a very good job with what they're doing. Okay. Let me stay, let me state unequivocally that the elections locally, state and national, were valid without fraud. And according to the rule of law, and that's the person I am. I'm a person as a judge who believes in the rule of law. And if there's any time in our community, our state, our country that we need the rule of law, it's now. Because we have people that are pushing back, saying that there's election fraud, that they're not valid elections, that there is the elections are a lie. There are election deniers. I think it's going to take proven leadership. It's going to take leadership at the community level to push back against those that are espousing those views that are destroying the sanctity and credibility of our elections. That's what this election is all about, this cycle or this race, about where you stand in regards to that. We have, as she just put it, dark forces, and those are the dark forces that I am going to push back on. In regards to the voting rights, we are having under siege of the right to vote, especially when it comes to seniors. And I'm going to push back on people that continue to restrict the rights of seniors, disabled, the veterans who have a constitutional right to vote. That is also under attack. We had numerous stories in our primary election about seniors who said, Judge, I, I, I didn't get the vote. I submitted my mail ballot 
And what? 20% of the primary ballot, of the mail-in ballot, was rejected because of the rights that were suppressed by the people in the office in either Austin or Washington, D.C. And that's why, at the local level, we've got to make sure our election department is, is protected. And she's right. Jackie Callanan has done a great job, but we've got to protect them. And she is under continual threat, not only physical threat, but threat to the credibility and integrity. People are questioning her and her election staff as to whether or not they're running valid elections. So this election is all about the leadership you choose. Thank you. What is your view on vote by mail and other non traditional approaches to voting, such as drive up voting or voting online? I support it. Anything we can do to make it easier to vote. We have now universal polling, and a lot of people don't realize universal polling means you can go to any poll now. You don't have to go to the precinct. We should have drive by polling. We should have increased ballot drop offs so that you can drop off your. But unfortunately, we got to follow the law. And I've already told you where I stand on that. As a county judge, I will use the county judge as a bully book to say, we got to increase the access. We got to make it easier. Our voting participation is abysmally low. And that's because there has been voter suppression. And so I'm challenging the leadership to say, hey, we got to make it easier and more accessible, especially for seniors, especially when they have to make sure they put their what, social security number and their driver's license. And you know what? We have to have to help our seniors during our primary. Put both. Because you don't know what, and you know what? Unfortunately, you got to make sure your signature is similar to what you uh, submitted. And then you have the ability to cure your ballot, and we have to then help those seniors vote. That is a travesty. And that is something, the reason why this election is so important, and that's why I'm running for county judge. Very So I sort of already addressed this in the prior question, which is the fact that I talked about technology is outpacing where we are really with elections. And so we look at new and different ways to be able to get people to vote. So yes, we absolutely, like I said, I talked about, you know, my 95 year old father who's at home is a consistent voter all the time. I think there have to be education and outreach efforts to seniors in a way that we tell them and make them secure and confident in making sure that when they cast their ballot, whether it's ballot by mail, whether we drive them to a polling location, a drive through polling location, because by the way, it's unacceptable to the rhetoric that's been out there uh, regarding an election was stolen. I don't believe that. I don't. I've been on the record as saying that. I mean, we have a democratic process. We have people that go to the polls, we vote, we count those votes. And so for what took place um, prior or after the most recent election is anti-democratic. And quite honestly, me explaining to my children what was happening at the Capitol on January 6th was sickening. Nobody should have to explain that to their children. And I want my children to be able to feel like my vote counts, and when I go, it's accepted. And so as we look at what are we doing for seniors, and what are we looking to do regarding drive-through locations, and what is the technology associated with voting, we're going to have to keep up with different methods of voting but we're gonna to have to have parameters around those to make sure that it's secure. And by the way, seniors are the consistent voters. God bless you for making sure that your vote counts and for being active in the process. Because young people don't go to the polls of the numbers that you all do. So I will tell you that we've gotta make sure we outreach to the fraternities like my son is in, like the families at UT to say, hey, you guys need to step up here. You're the next generation. You're going to make a difference here. And I feel like that's the example I've tried to set for my kids and why I got into this race. Life is not about sitting on the sidelines, folks, and waiting to ask permission 
to get something done. It's about using an opportunity for leadership and the, the way to be able to make a real difference, as Teddy Roosevelt said, is the man in the arena who's got dirt and blood and sweat and tears on him because he's trying to do the right thing. That's leadership, and that's what I will think about. Thank you. Preserving life, the Kuach Nefesh, the highest Jewish value. How would Medicaid expansion passed in Texas affect Bear County? Barry? So I've been on the record too, and I ran for the county commissioner that I feel like we need to have Medicaid expansion in the state of Texas. Uh, we have a huge poverty problem here, and particularly here in Bear County. And guess who pays for it in the long term? We all do, not just people in the room, but me too. I mean, as a small business owner who's employed people for the better part of 25 years on the back of a paycheck, the front of a paycheck, really, I mean, helped to sustain this economy. And it's exactly why I stepped up the run for this office, because in a post-COVID environment, I think you want somebody who's a small business owner, which, by the way, 85% of the economy, many of you here, are built on the backs of small businesses. But we can work hard all day long, but if we say no, no, no to everything that comes our way, especially regarding... Medicaid expansion. And I have been not just on the record regarding expanding Medicaid in Texas to save you all money in the long run. I've also been on the record that we need to consolidate the Metro Health Department over the city with the University Health System over the county. Because we are not expanding or amplifying accessibility and affordability to health care for this community. We are, and I'm going to be pretty blunt about this. We are lopping off people's ankles due to diabetes and legs and morbid obesity and heart disease and grade two part in number, and we just accepted it. So when we talk about the ability to be able to merge Metro Health with UHS and expand, greatly expand and elevate what we're doing and bring in University Health System into that equation, I'm not somebody as a leader, and when I get into this office and I wasn't that as a county commissioner, that's ever going to accept the status quo because we can do better. That's what we do as small business people every single day. We say, I, I laugh about the fact I have this restless discontent with the status quo because we got to be moving the needle here, folks. With the same property right here in Bear County that we've had since 1984. The poorest zip code is still 78207 on the near west side. So I'm not been a professional politician. I've not been there for 26 years. But I am a small business owner, and I'm a pragmatist, and I am somebody who has energy and ideas and a bold vision of what we can accomplish for this county because we shouldn't accept second best, and we shouldn't accept mediocrity. So anyway, thank you. I mean, I've talked a lot about my ideas regarding this topic, but it's important. It's really important. That's okay. Can you restate that question, please? Uh, healthcare, preserving life, walk that fish the highest Jewish value, how would Medicaid expansion passed in Texas affect their economy? It would be a game changer. It's billions of dollars that we're not getting because of the leadership in Austin. And again, as county judge, I'm going to advocate for the expansion of Medicaid because that is going to be the game changer for our public health here in Bear County. One of the biggest initiatives that the current commissioner's court has uh, moved and created this new public health entity. She, she, uh, Commissioner Barry has suggested consolidation. What I'm going to suggest is no. What we need to do is not avoid the duplication of services. The city and county has separate services, and that's a, really a separate issue. But in regards to public health, let us not forget that in our current state, Medicaid has the biggest impact on women mortality. And in regards to also infant care, especially the neonatal care. And so the expansion of Medicaid is crucial for women's health care. We also know the reality. The Dobbs case has basically affected the rights of what constitutional rights of women to their own reproductive health choices. And so the challenges are going to be very much on a local level. What are we going to do? For the people that are the least of us. And basically, what is going to have to happen is the university hospital system is going to have to 
make sure that we cover those health issues, nutrition, wellness, dealing with those diseases of obesity and diabetes. That is the opportunity that this public health entity, the county public health entity, brings to this community to basically focus in on the infrastructure, which is most important as the children and families of our community. And so in regards to expansion, by all means, there is an opportunity. I will tell you, having been a judge in a court work for child welfare, there's a thing called 1115 waiver. And what it boils down to is, it's the opportunity at the local level, and it's something I want to explore because Congressman Lloyd Doggett is pushing a cover now act that will allow waiver of Medicaid expansion at the local level. So there is opportunity. I've had the experience with child welfare to expand those services for the foster care. And that's what I want to do for the families and children of Bear County is to make sure they're taken care of in the most effective and compassionate way. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got to bring the experts to the table, bring the stakeholders to the table, and come up with the solutions to these complex problems. Judge you first on this one. If you were elected, how would you address health care, including reducing maternal mortality and access to female reproductive health care at county hospitals and within Bear County? Please also address if you support a woman's right to choose an abortion. Yes. <laughs> clearly. And that's why I believe separates me and my opponent. I've clearly stated that. What we're going to have to do is obviously create an opportunity the situation that I think I've already answered the question. So basic, I want to help y'all understand how important it is to understand the needs of the community. As a judge, I saw that obviously mental health and drug alcohol addiction and domestic violence are really big factors that deal with women and children. And one of the things that we must focus on is that we have to then bring the experts together. We gotta to bring the stakeholders together. And that's what I did as your children's court judge. I said, let's come together to deal with these complex issues of families. Let's come up with a solution. Let's come up and figure out what we can do, and what we decided to do, and figure it out. Because you gotta provide wraparound service. You've got to employ restorative justice principles that focuses on the positive aspects of people and to basically not create a handout, but a hand up. And that's what we need to do for our people, the community here in Bear County. We have to address their needs, meet them where they're at, and find the solutions and, and, the, and the answers to the complex issues they deal with. And that's my commitment as your next county judge. I think you heard my opponent talk about the fact I talked a little bit about the opportunity and the impact that exists regarding merging Metro Health at the city with the University Health System at the county. It's not just an opportunity to scale impact regarding healthcare in this community, but it's an opportunity also to save you money in the long run. So we talked about the fact that he just stood up there and said, you know, he's not in favor of necessarily consolidation, that he's okay with duplication of services. That's not okay in government. Duplication of services is not okay. So we've got a lot of people that have talked about what are you doing regarding we, the city has an animal care services department, the county has one too or whatever. My feeling is, look, if we could get that one domino to fall regarding health care, what else could we do regarding not just animal care services, but you guys live very close to Orsino Park, right over here off the Road or whatever. That's a county park. But I can tell you right now, as a city commissioner for the past year, whatever I can tell you, we don't spend nearly as much at the county on parks as we do over the city of San Antonio. So why not let that other town fall? And then we have an animal care services problem here. So why not merge the two entities so that we can really begin to scale impact and make a difference here in a way that has never been made before? So as I talk about the merger to Metro Health and UHS, yes, it absolutely impacts maternal morbidity. It does. 
That's a huge problem, not just in the River Grand Valley, but here too. By the way, it's associated with the poverty rate that we have here. And so I have a opponent here who, as I talked about, a big bold idea and moving the jail out of the west side, which has the poorest zip code. And we look at lifting people out of poverty. That's a very there on the west side. We have the opportunity to be able to move that jail somewhere else and inspire economic development on the west side of San Antonio. Ladies and gentlemen, a rising tide floats all boats. We pull people out of poverty and we bridge the wage gap that doesn't exist there. And so that impacts what they're doing at university health system, the new women's and children's hospital, which I appropriated money as a county commissioner on that court to make sure that we have a standing women's and children's hospital. And I've toured that hospital. And I've talked to George Fernandez, who's the CEO, about that. And so as we talk about the threat of reproductive rights to women, listen, folks, there have to be exceptions to it. I'm there all day long. Ten more seconds, I'll tell you. In between two pregnancies that I had, I had a baby that had severe birth defects, that I had to terminate that pregnancy, and it impacted me today for the rest of my life. Today, I wouldn't be able to do that. That's not acceptable. There have to be exceptions to the rule, like rape, incest, health for the mother. I'm going to advocate for that at the legislature because it's important to women that we do this. Thank you. Thank you. Bear County has one of the highest death rates of women in domestic abuse situations. What are the major policy solutions you would implement to lower domestic violence in Bear County? So this is a big, big deal for me. Um, um, you know, we're being real, we're being authentic, and we're being, you know, raw here today. Um, I grew up in a household that was somewhat toxic. Um, my parents divorced when I was six years old. I probably saw things I shouldn't have to have seen. And so for that reason, when I got onto the court, and I learned that there was a backlog of more than 5,000 cases of domestic violence, I said, what, what's up with that? Like, that can't continue to happen. Granted, COVID, you know, the ability not to hear those cases was a part of it. But I asked the DA to come down into my office and have a conversation with me about that. And I said, Joe, what do we need to do about that? He said, I need more judges to hear cases. I absolutely need that. And I said, well, what if every judge heard a domestic violence case to clear the backlog versus it being just the specialty courts? Because we have two specialty courts associated with domestic violence. He said, well, he kind of was like, he laughed and he said, good luck with that. He said, because there are some judges who are like, uh, I wasn't elected to do that. I'm not going to do that. And I said, well, we're going to see about that. So I passed a resolution with the entire court with me on this. And we put that out there and generated media associated with it and said, you know what? You're not going to say no. You're not going to hear that case. What you are going to say is yes, because women and children are living in fear. And it is your job to step up and do this at this time. So at the end of the day, two days later, we had all judges that were doing domestic violence cases. And I sent a personal thank you now to each of those judges for stepping out to be able to do that. I also led the effort because we still have the highest rate of domestic violence in Bear County of any county in the state, despite the fact we've had folks that have been working on this for 26 years or however, we're not moving the needle. And so I led the effort in talking to the DA's office and the court system about what do we need? We need more prosecutors, we need more investigators, we need more advocates who are in the system. And I was pleased, like I said, another one of my proudest days on the court was to be able to appropriate more than $300 million from the court for more prosecutors and investigators to the DA's office. And folks, as I stand before you today, I wanted to appropriate more because there's more work that needs to be done, not just at the DA's office, but it's a battered women's shelter and they got cut out of the mix. But we've got to do more. And so my opponents had a collaborative commission on domestic violence for the past five years. The newspapers criticized for not moving the needle and not having metrics and data associated with what is happening regarding domestic violence and stopping it here in Bear County. Thank you. As you've heard, domestic violence is one of the big issues that really is destroying the infrastructure of our community, the children and families. And so I've dedicated my whole life to deal with domestic violence. And yes, I created the Clatter Commission on Domestic Violence, and I'm proud of that commission. Why? Because it brought everybody together. The key is not 
with all due respect, Commissioner, it's not spending more money. It's not saying let's get more prosecutors. Let's not, you know, let's get more resources. No, it's about bringing people together to deal with this issue. It's dealing with the National Council of Jewish Women, who I've had the opportunity to work with in dealing with an educational program for the children of our community, the Can't Be Love Program, the film festival. Excuse me. And what we have done is to educate our children. One thing I learned from Martha Pelias, the uh, Executive Director of Family Violence Prevention Services, is you can't change action and behavior unless you change beliefs and attitudes. And that's the reason why it's so important that we come together as a community. It's not about I, it's not about her, it's about we. What do we do as a community to deal with domestic violence? And what we need to do is, much like what we did with the anti-Semitic, anti-hate, I mean the hate crimes, we got to educate our community. We got to bring forth coalitions. What are we doing on that? On that? The interfaith coalitions, the Jewish Catholic uh, Hanukkah luncheon that we do every year that I have I've been proud to go to. We come together and celebrate what is good of us, what we have in common. And that's what we need to do in regards to the best of violence. We've got to be a We've got to come together and communicate. We've got to collaborate. We've got to coordinate. We've got to bring the court system, the district attorney's office, and the law enforcement, and the nonprofit, and the faith-based community to all come together and deal with this complex issue of domestic violence. I wish I could say, with a magic wand, I can do away with domestic violence, but that's not going to happen. And that's, are we, that's unrealistic. And so my commitment to you is to continue to fight and combat domestic violence and bring us together to find the solutions to this complex issue. Uh, as county judge, how would you reduce homelessness in Bear County? What would you do to help with food insecurity and the poor? Great question. One of the platforms that I have is basically what I'm calling their necessities, B-E-X, hard necessities, a back to basics budget for Bear County to focus in on what I consider the most precious infrastructure. That's the children and families of our community to be child-centric and family focused. And what I want to do in person is affordable housing. We lack a capacity of affordable housing. Anybody who works and is involved with him and your home, know that that great facility is full of children and families. But what is the reality is, it's the working poor that continue to get displaced and will continue to be displaced in this post-COVID world. So we need an increase in capacity of housing. And we'll do that with partnering with the nonprofit community, with faith-based community, and with government. Government can't be big enough it has to be big enough to protect its people, but it's small enough to stay within its budget. And so it is going to take a public-private partnership to fix that issue, to find those solutions. What we need, also need to recognize is the chronic homeless. Much of them are military people with PTSD, with significant mental health. We need a housing first. We've got to move them off the street, so to speak, and put them into housing. And we need, then again, need to partner up with the nonprofit, the faith-based community, and find those solutions. And I want to bring the military and say, hey, most of the population are military veterans that have been disconnected. We need to bring them back in under some chain of command process. And so the complexity of homelessness is a multi-pronged process. It's not gonna be spending more money out here. It's about us coming together and finding the solutions. I think you've come quite clear to understand how I work. I want to partner up with you. I want to partner up with the nonprofit. I want to partner up with the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. I want to bring your power, your voice, and let's come together as a community. And that's the reason why I'm the unifier, not the divider. Mr. Barry. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Oh my goodness, so many things to say on this topic. So let me begin first by saying I take a little bit of umbrage to the fact that when I appropriated $300 million to combat domestic violence, that's completely discounted. It is about programming, it is about strategy, but it also is about appropriating resources and dedicating resources that are needed to try to solve the problem here in Bear County and San Antonio. Same reason I appropriated more money for county constables to serve temporary protective orders and temporary restraining orders when the sheriff had gutted his civil division and there were stacks of those that were laying around. Guess what? One of the best days on the campaign trail during the primaries when I had somebody from Child Protective Services come up to me and say, you're the commissioner that got more constables to serve TPOs and TROs, right? And I said, yes, sir, it's nice to meet you. And he said, let me just tell you, I'm not a lifelong Democrat, but I'm voting for you because it has never worked any better than it's worked today. So that's the kind of inventive thinking that we've got to bring into the office of Bear County Judge. You don't just rubber stamp things that come across your desk. And yes, bold ideas and a big vision, you know, have that all day long. And yes, it makes people a little bit uncomfortable. But government is not necessarily about sitting on a $2.8 billion budget. It is about cost efficiency and taxpayer efficiency and savings to you all who are sitting here today. But it's also about appropriating money where we feel like we can really make a huge impact. And domestic violence is one of those, which is why, like I said, I'm proud of the fact that I did that. And much like the homeless strategy we have here at San Antonio, I toured Can Ministries, Christian Assistance Ministries. I've been down and talked to Gavin Rogers, who I consider to be a good friend of mine over at Travis Park United Methodist Church and what he's doing for the homeless down there. But when I've gone to neighborhood associations across this county, north, south, east, and west, folks are tired of not just the homeless issue that we have here, but how it contributes to crime. Petty crime, petty theft, break-ins, car thefts, what have you. And there have to be ramifications associated with that. So some of this is, what do we do for folks who are arrested? We don't put them in jail necessarily. But there has to be a place to be able to combat this. And a large part of the homeless issue that we have here is not just in San Antonio and Bear County. We have not done enough in this country to affect mental health. We've got to have more mental health beds here in San Antonio. I have talked about a mental health facility with ARPA funds to put 150 beds in there, get people stabilized, back on their medication with wraparound services to make them productive members of society. That is my pledge to you. Thank you. How would you suggest we balance the needs of a growing county with the needs to provide water and electricity to all residents, as well as balancing the environmental impact of the growth? Ooh, that's a loaded topic. Um, let me first begin by the fact that a majority of the growth in this county is a great outside the city limits of San Antonio and in suburban cities, much like where we're at right now. So as we look at 2050 and we look at perhaps 6 million people being in this area by that time, we've got to make sure that we are keeping up with the rate of growth that we have here. And what becomes laser focused and important are utilities. So go utilities, so goes growth. Regarding not just city public service, but also our CPS energy, but also San Antonio water systems. Guess what, folks? The county judge doesn't even have an ex officio board position on the board of CPS Energy, nor does she have one on the board of San Antonio Water Systems. And so if you look at two things, the majority of the growth occurring outside the city limits of San Antonio, and when you look at a third of CPS revenue coming from suburban cities and outside the city of San Antonio, and the county not having a seat at the table, what is that effectively? That is taxation without representation. Yes, that's exactly right. Because let me let me ask you, do you think $31 is rebate to your bill was enough after some again? Mm -hmm. Nope. But the county's not at seat at the table to be able to make an impact where that's concerned. So yes, we absolutely at the county have to focus on weatherization efforts. We got to focus on you know, when we look at the fleet that we have and making sure it's a natural gas fleet, the cost savings that we can incur there. But most importantly, we've got to look at how the rate of growth is impacting you. And I'm just telling you, 
I'm going to advocate for having a seat on that board of CPS and a SOS because we've got to make sure that you all have representation. And granted, that means we've got to advocate at the ledge, and we've got to make sure that we've got a fully pulpit, a strong voice to be able to do that. But it's unacceptable what we went through with the big freeze. People need to be held accountable. CPS Energy was nowhere. I mean, they were blank faces on a television screen. My mother, who was at a Dante not far from here, her power went out at a Dante. She broke her shoulder, had to crawl out of the hallway so somebody could find her to take her to a hospital. Those assisted living facilities need to be on a hospital grid so they don't lose power either. I'm going to be an advocate for that as well as making sure you all have representation. Thank you. In regard in regards to the environment, I want to make clearly I have a commitment to protect the aquifer and to protect our environment and to protect, obviously, as we develop. Now, having said that, I've, I've, we've had forums, debates in front of the developers, real estate council. And so I have pledged to them that I will always have them at the table and to be able to listen to them. But I also want to make that commitment to you. Especially if you are a person that is very strong on the environment and a person that wants to make sure that we grow in a very responsible way. And it's going to be a county judge that is able to listen to all points of view and then make decisions. To give you an idea of who I am and what I am, as a judge, that was my job to listen to everybody who came into the court to give dignity and respect to all those who came in there and to make decisions especially in regards to those abuse and neglect cases or those family law cases decisions that have life and death consequences and then be able to stay that decision and explain it so that people can then either appeal it or decide whether they want to move forward or not. And that's what it's gonna take in regards to the environment. I've got to be able to say, hey, we gotta protect the aquifer, we gotta protect our land, but at the same time, we're gonna to have to grow. And the growth is going to be on the unincorporated area. It's gonna be outside the city of San Antonio because the legislature pretty much has restricted the city ability to annex. So what does that mean? That means that we have what's called emergency service districts now that will provide the fire protection and the emergency services. Yes, we got to be prepared for those emergency plans, whether it's drought or whether it's freeze or and what. And so what we do need to do is we got to be able to come together and find those solutions. And that's my pledge to you to always have you at the table and to listen as to what the needs are and to make those tough decisions. And I'll be doing that for you as your next county judge. Our next topic yeah, is immigration. But judge Sakai will be first with this one. How would you address the influx of immigrants and asylum seekers into our county? And what do you feel are the biggest challenges? You know, that, 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 that's a hard issue. And but let me just say this. Obviously, my grandparents came over in the early 1900s. They came to this country to seek opportunity. They came to seek opportunity for their family and to establish themselves and to become Americans. And that's what they've done. And so, you know, I realized it is a very hot issue and it's been argued over in the political debates and the, polit in the current election cycle. But I'm committed to treat all immigrants with respect and dignity, especially those that are coming across in order to seek asylum. And then I think it needs to be clearly stated, there are many people coming here to do what my grandparents did, to establish a new life, to establish themselves, to become part of the American dream, to provide for their children, to protect their children. And I find what we're doing to them by shipping them all across the country 
with no consolidation, no collaboration, no communication, no coordination, as unjust and moral. And as a county judge, I will make a commitment. And I've seen that Mayor Harburger did that with the, the flood situation in New Orleans and Houston. I saw Judge Wolf step up with, with those immigrant children that came in on a search. And it's going to be my commitment as your next county judge to treat everyone with dignity and respect and communicate with all our stakeholders to solve the solution, to solve the problem, to find the solutions that what well, we need to do to treat these families with compassion and respect. Very other people talk at close and you all I'm done with stunts, I'm done with tricks. You know, regarding this issue. There's not a whole lot, I'll be honest with you, that the county judge can necessarily do about this position. But I will tell you, even in the 90s, I was working on comprehensive integration reform, which is where we need to get back to. It's not about closing all the borders, it's not about opening all the borders. Because for as long as you and I are here. As long as the United States of America is the land of promise and opportunity, people are going to want to come here. It's been that. I mean, for, for a century, it's been that. So what do we do about it, right? We've got a legal process by which people come in here. And like I said, it's about people coming together and looking at a solution. It's about Republicans and moderates and independents and Democrats and no matter where you land on the spectrum. It's about how do we channel change and positive change associated with how people immigrate to this country. And so, but the problem that we have today is that drug cartels are in control, but yes, there has to be humanity and respect afforded to the people that come across here. However, it's gotta be, like I said, done with a strategic initiative on how we're gonna get there. And right now, the policy's broken. If you look back on what needed to happen, you look at the McCain-Kennedy bill, which was John McCain, a Republican, by the way, my kind of Republican, Ted Kennedy, who came together that crafted legislation that probably was the best opportunity we had at comprehensive immigration reform. A circulatory path to citizenship, you know, people getting visas and work visas and guest visas and going back. I mean, that's where we need to get back to. You know, it's unfortunate that we live in an environment that is what it is today, which makes it very difficult for any of us sitting up here to run today. Because I think what we're doing is we want the common good. And we want what's in the best interest of people, the folks that are trying to get here. And so, like I said, stunts and tricks and things like that won't be tolerated as a Bear County judge. But what we will do is we will make sure that when people come here, but like I said, they're treated with respect and dignity associated with them trying to make a better life for themselves. But by the same token, also making sure that our resources locally are not being taxed, whether that's healthcare, whether that's education, et cetera, because it's got to be a total 360 solution. Thank you. I think we are out of time for our questions. So we're going to give each candidate two minutes to wrap up. So, uh, Mr. Berry, by the opening class, Judge Sakai has the opportunity to go first with closing remarks. Judge, two minutes. Well, thank you all very much for this opportunity. It's, it's been a wonderful opportunity to kind of share with you our thoughts and, and what differences you see between the two candidates. My name is Judge Peter Sakai. And again, I ask for your support. I ask for your vote. Let me remind you all who I am and perhaps repeat what I just said. I'm a person who believes in the rule of law. I will take an oath to defend the Constitution of laws of this state and the United States. And that's the same oath I will take as county judge. And I have told you why I think it's so important that we follow the rule of law at this time. I'm also a person that is open and transparent, and I want government, I want county government to be open and transparent. And that's something that county government needs to work on. I want better customer service from county government. And that is something that I'm going to do when I first come in there is to evaluate all the county departments to figure out are we providing the best service for the constituents here in Bear County? And finally, I'm a unifier, not a divider. I'm somebody that's going to work with all the elected officials and find those solutions. I've been quite clear how I work and what I did and, my, and, and the essence of leadership. And the reason why I ask and submit to you as I'm the best candidate is because it's about proven leadership. 
the late Colin Powell says that leadership is about connecting people. It's about bringing people together. And as your district court judge and children's court, that's what I have done my entire time. And that's what you're going to get as the next county judge. What you see is what you get. I've been endorsed by Judge Nelson Wolf. I've been endorsed by the county commissioners. I've been endorsed by former Mayor Bill Harper. People who believe in me as a proven leader with a proven track record. And I ask for your vote and I ask for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I feel like what I bring to the table is a refreshing change of pace. I'm not a professional politician. I've not been in office for 26 years. And if we look at the past 26 years, some of the things that I talked about, the rate of domestic violence hasn't changed. The rate of poverty hasn't changed here. What I have been is a small business owner. I've employed up to 100 people. At one time, I employed 25 people, the latest effort. Founded two businesses, sign in front of a paycheck and the back of a paycheck. Sustained a business group through good times and bad. COVID was bad, but we did it. You know, made sure that we had 100% healthcare taken care of for our employees. And by the way, I was revolutionary and innovative in early 2000s when I had on site daycare for my employees to be able to bring their kids into work. And it was completely subsidized by us. So that's the kind of leadership that I want to bring to this seat. And most importantly, I am the mother. And I've been a single mother of two children who are the biggest blessings in my life. My 20 year old son, who's at UT, and my 17 year old daughter, who's a senior in high school. And a mother who had a huge influence on me. And as a fiscal conservative, what did she tell me? And a small business owner. If you count the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm afraid to appropriate money, because I've told you all where I've, I've appropriated money to make sure that we're moving the needle and we're making a difference. That's the kind of leadership that I want to bring to this seat. And as a county commissioner, I think I was very effective. Lower the property tax rate to the lowest it's been in 25 years. Establish a family lead policy, body camera turnaround policy in the sheriff's office of 10 days. Made sure that we appropriated a historic amount of money for domestic violence. And then made sure we had the elder fraud unit restored to the DA's office. I did not let any grass grow under my feet when I get into that office. Because that's what you do as a small business owner. You're not necessarily a professional politician. What you are is a solution finder. You find the problems and you figure out the solutions. And for far too long, ladies and gentlemen, cronyism is alive and well at the Bureau County Courthouse. I'm going to put a stop to that when I get into the seat at your next Bureau County Judge. Thank you. Blessed to be the opportunity to be here. Thanks to the JCRC for inviting me into the candidates, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Epstein. Thank you so much, judges um, and um, judge candidates, excuse me. Thank you so much for coming today. We learned so much, and um, what a great opportunity for the Jewish community to hear from both of you. And thank you to our audience. Um, please go out and vote. Um, don't forget the early voting period. You can vote, as they both said, um, in, in any county polling place. And if you need to vote by mail, there are some applications um, out there on the table. And if you need to change your address or you're not registered, there's an application to do that as well. And uh, thank you to all the volunteers from JCRC and NCJW who made this event happen. Good night.